heads of the, uh, the flowers here on the platform, and that's because of the uh, memorial service that was held yesterday morning as we celebrated Brother Lou's homegoing. Uh, it was a wonderful time, and uh, it was a, quote, celebration of life. And so uh, we know where he is far better off to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. So anyway, uh, we'll, we'll just keep the flowers here, and uh, it, it makes the area look a little bit more pleasant, right? So uh, you know why we have all of these spreads out here. What we're going to do this morning is uh, continue on here in Second Corinthians chapter 5. We're focusing in especially on verse 21. Verse 21, uh, it's just an absolutely amazing and yet puzzling verse. Uh, When we look at what our dear Lord and Savior Jesus Christ literally experienced, physically, emotionally, psychologically, um, it's just... Uh, I I don't think we can adequately grasp the depth of what he literally experienced. We're going to look at the issue of the cross. On the one hand, there's ugliness to it, but at the same time, there is beauty to it as well. So uh, the passage that we're focusing in on, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, for he, that would be God the Father, hath made him, that would be the Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, We've been spending a little bit of time examining what theology refers to as penal substitutionary atonement and I hope we provided enough uh, information to demonstrate that uh, that is a valid legitimate teaching in the word of God okay. Uh, The Lord Jesus Christ did die as our proxy, as our substitute. The concept of substitution is embedded in the Old Testament. And certainly, when we read, for example, Ephesians chapter 5, when we read there in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, "...be ye therefore followers of God as dear children." And walk in love as Christ also loved us and hath given himself, here we go, for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. We spent a little bit of time in the opening chapters of the book of Leviticus. And uh, the Lord, he instituted the system of animal sacrifice to address and deal with the sins of the nation of Israel, national sins, and for that matter, personal sins as well. And there was a very orderly, strict procedure that the Lord uh, instituted. And uh, we've already said enough uh, regarding how it is that the one who offers the sacrifice is responsible to bring that sacrifice to the sanctuary. And God, he instructs the offerer to place his hand upon the head of the animal. And then what is that offerer expected to do? That sinner that the one who is offering the sacrifice is responsible in killing the sacrifice. God, he makes sure that the offerer, the sinner, understands that what's taking place is an absolute bloody mess and you, the sinner, is responsible. What Jesus did... He gives himself. He personally offers himself. He personally gives his life. He's the one offering himself in the stead, on behalf, in the place, as a proxy, the sinner. He kills himself. He gives his own blood. So there's just beautiful imagery, typology, figure, and shadow. And so anyway, we're not going to uh, you know, uh, continue down the path of theology and so on and so forth. For some reason, theology needlessly struggles with the concept of penal substitutionary atonement. And you know why they struggle with it? Because they're approaching it from a philosophical point of view. How can a just God punish an innocent man? And by the way, there are verses that clearly teach that God will never hold the innocent responsible for the guilty. But 
what do we understand what Jesus Christ did? He dies as guilty. See, that's the key to it all. So theology, and, and, and I don't recommend you study all of the philosophical arguments uh, that objects to penal substitution or atonement. Your head will stop spinning. Uh, you know, you just stick to the Word of God, and really life becomes a whole lot easier and a lot simpler, okay? Uh, I'd rather be simple-minded and just believe what the verses say than, you know, tread the path of uh, philosophical argumentation and so on. So, so anyway, I don't want to... So what, what we're going to do this morning, the question is, what is it that the Lord Jesus Christ literally experienced while he's there on the cross of Calvary? And so I want to just sort of uh, explain what I wrote here on the dry erase board. There is a, 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 a transaction that is taking place between God the Father and, and God the Son. Hence, we have the cross, we have God, and we have uh, humanity, okay? And uh, what takes place, remember we saw there in Genesis chapter 22, we see Abraham uh, and his son Isaac, and, and God... He, God sees himself in, in Abraham and in Isaac. And uh, the, the verse there is so precious. When Abraham tells his servants, he, you know, two men went with him. He, Abraham says to these guys, you stay here and just me and the boy are going to go on to that mountain alone. You think about Calvary, quote, Mount Calvary. There is a transaction that's taking place personally between God the Father and God the Son. And and you know what? It's the two of them alone that's going to achieve for humanity what it desperately needs, redemption. And thank God we're not participating in any of this. I already kiddingly mentioned. No, I'm not kidding. If, If God asked for our participation, we would screw it all up. So praise God. Lord, you go alone and you do it for us. But anyway, this little picture here. So just I want to emphasize uh, there is a convulsion. There is something that takes place between the father and the son. And, and uh, what we always want to remember, what Jesus does is for us, substitutionary atonement. But don't ever forget as us. That is absolutely critical in understanding what our dear Savior did, all right? What he does on the cross, it's yes for us, but he's dying as us. There is the legitimate doctrine called substitution, but there is also an important doctrine in, the, in, in God's word called federal representation or federal headship, all right? God holds all of humanity responsible for the failure of Adam. How can God do that? Because Adam, the first man, he's the federal head of humanity. He's the federal representation of all of humanity. Who is Jesus Christ? He's the second man. He's the last Adam. So it's important to recognize the doctrine of federal representation. When Christ is hanging there on the cross, praise God, he's taking my place. But he's not just taking my place. He's dying as me. He dies as you. He dies as the personification of wickedness. Now, look at verse, oh, go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Please recognize, don't don't miss what verse 21 is saying. For he, the Father, hath made him, the Son, to be sin for us, who knew. This is critically important. And, And Paul wants to make sure nobody walks away thinking Jesus was a sinner. And no, he, Jesus knew no sin. By the way, there are modern Bible translations that translate that verse as he had no sin. You recognize how the modern Bible translations begin to dilute and degrade and soften and weaken the very nature of our Lord Jesus Christ? There's a difference between who knew no sin and he had no sin. You know what the implication is? He just chose not to sin. To, it, water knows no dryness. Uh, light knows no darkness. 
You, you, you see, there's a there's a, an important distinction to be made here. It isn't just Jesus merely saying, I'll just not commit a sin. He couldn't in his person, in his being, intrinsically, his very nature. He, knew, he doesn't know what it is personally in, in, the way he, in the way he exists, okay? He knows what sin is. I mean, he died for sins, right? But he, in his essence, in his being, the core of his very identity, he has no experience because water knows no dryness. Again, light knows no darkness. So uh, I just want to point that out because, uh, again, there is attempt by, quote, modern scholarship to sort of devalue who Jesus is. He knew no sin, okay? Now, uh, the idea of, of not only dying for us, and, and we've, been, uh, I, we've been to en- enough verses, I, you know, he, for us, for us, for us. But, but we want to just recognize as us, okay? Uh, the cross stands as an emblem, as a metaphor, if you will. The cross stands as an emblem of the very heart of the gospel message. Now, are we talking about the literal object? You know, by the way, Jesus did die on a literal object called the cross, right? The Jewish perspective, as Peter says, he died on a tree. We mentioned there's an interesting way of viewing uh, the work of the cross, okay? Uh, from the Jewish perspective, First Peter, as well as Paul in the book of Galatians chapter 3, cursed is every man that hangeth on a what? That's how a Jew talks. See, the Jew take, goes back to Deuteronomy, and, and God said, you take the rebellious son and you put him on a tree for the whole nation of Israel to see. Okay? that that rebellious son is suffering the consequences of punishment at the hands of a just, holy, righteous God, right? And then, of course, you take that body down before sunset. You understand all that. But the Jewish perspective is the tree, the tree, the tree. The Gentile perspective is the cross, the cross, the cross. Now, Paul is not saying we worship. Uh, go over to Galatians chapter 6. Uh, Galatians chapter 6. Obviously, Paul... Is, is not suggesting that we worship the literal object, you know? Uh, there are religious systems that you, you see. I'll be, actually, there are unsaved people that wear jewelry. And, and there was a time where it was kind of in vogue, I guess, to wear a crucifix. And if you'd ask them, what does that mean to you? They couldn't give you a clear answer. I mean... You know, the, the cross was uh, uh, the instrument that was used. We understand. We don't worship the object. We don't worship that wooden uh, cross, crucifix, okay? We, we understand. We recognize when Paul talks about the cross, and he does talk about the cross. Here's, here's a beautiful verse, Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross, not the object, but What happened on the cross? It stands as an emblem. It stands as a metaphor. The very heart of all that God is the good news of of what God the Father accomplishes through the death of his, His beloved Son. So it's sort of all summarized by that word cross. But it was an instrument of torture, okay? We don't worship the instrument of torture any more than we would worship a guillotine or worship a syringe, uh, or worship an electric chair, or worship a rifle. You understand that. We, we, we see beyond all of that nonsense, right? I, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He died as us. Before we get underway looking at some of these passages, uh, tell you what, you, you go to uh, Philippians chapter 2, and of course this is, this is the starting point, you know. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, uh, I just want to share with you a, uh, an historic incident, and uh, maybe you're familiar with, uh, there, there was a, during the Civil War, there was a gentleman, uh, his name was George Wyatt, okay, uh, this is during the Civil War, okay? Uh, he had a wife and he had six children. During the Civil War, uh, a, a drafted 
person, a man who was drafted into the Union Army, could pay someone to serve as his proxy, as his substitute, okay? So it, it just so happens that uh, George Wyatt, he, he receives his draft notice. And I guess he was affluent, but he, he had a wife, he had six children. Well, he found uh, a young man who was willing to serve, and this is important, as George Wyatt. See, the word proxy, I, I'm just going to use the word proxy because that, I think, carries with it the idea. Um, uh, this young man, his name was Richard Pratt. I had a teacher whose name was Richard Pratt. I'll always remember who this guy is, Richard Pratt. So uh, Richard Pratt, he, he offered to uh, serve in the Union Army during the Civil War as George Wyatt's substitute. I'm going to be George's proxy, okay? So, unfortunately, uh, Richard Pratt, he's killed in action, okay? Well, shortly thereafter, the draft board, the authorities, military figures, they, uh, they found out that the real, original George Wyatt was, was alive and never served in the Union Army, okay? George Wyatt he had enough money to hire lawyers. Um, he protested and he legally challenged the draft board's uh, attempt to enlist George Wyatt. George's art legal argument was, no, Richard Pratt, he died as me. And that, was, that threw a monkey wrench in, in the, the legal uh, machinery and the legal gears, okay? If the Union Army said it is legitimate and valid to allow someone, you can pay someone to, to serve in your place, can that person also die in your place? Isn't that interesting? So this was kind of something unique and the long and short of it is, George's lawyers argue that Richard Pratt was George's substitute, that, that Richard, Richard Pratt, had died as a representative. Now, you we're talking about federal representation. George Pratt died in the person of his, George's representation. Richard Pratt through identification, died as George Wyatt. And you know what the legal authorities concluded? You're right. George Wyatt is now exempt. He's immune from ever having to be enlisted. He died in the Civil War. And then interesting, even, in, uh, even during the 1800s, even our legal system recognizes the doctrine of representation, the doctrine of substitution. But it's not an original concept. The Lord already established that going way back, not only in Israel's history, but going way back in the book of Genesis. Again, Abraham and his son Isaac, right? And, and I just love what Abraham said. Uh, the Lord will provide himself. The Lord alone is going to provide, of course, a lamb. And, and we already commented on all of that. So I uh, just sort of think about uh, Jesus Christ dying not only for us, but as us. So Philippians chapter 2 is, is a great starting point. Uh, what did our dear Savior experience on the death of the cross? And again, from one perspective, and certainly between the Father and the Son, uh, this was a horror. This was horror. I mean, this event, it, it's an atrocity. And, and again, I, I just don't want to be dramatic here, but what is taking place when our Savior is hanging on the altar of Calvary and, and he's doing it uh, uh, to himself? He, he, he's doing it in himself. It's repulsive. It, it, it is just horrific. It is an absolute disgusting event. 
the beloved spotless son is going to experience something uh, on that cross which results in a convulsion, for lack of a better word. Something happens between father and the son. And by the way, I, I, don't, I am not saying Jesus is no longer God. You know, the, the, you know, for the ages, men, theologians, Bible students, you know, have, have tried to understand. It, Jesus was man, 100% man. Jesus is 100% God, okay? He wasn't 50% man, 50% God, nor was he a Siamese twin. Okay, here, here's my, wow, one half is God, the other half is humanity, and I know sometimes we talk about what Jesus experiences in, in his humanity at the expense of losing sight on a relationship as God. By the way, uh, it's not the ungodding of God. A God. Okay, I, uh, you know, you'll, you might find an article out there. Oh, yeah, what happened there on the cross of Calvary is uh, God died. Wait. There is no moment in all of eternity where, where God dies, okay? Uh, it, it's the crucifixion of God. Wait a minute. The ungodding of God, okay? No, don't, no, no, that's, that's not true. So then explain it. How? <laughs> How do you explain? You know, we use, there's theological language, you know, the anthropic, you know, the hypostatic union, you know. Uh, there's the two natures that become one. But, but I, have, I struggle with the idea of Jesus being a Siamese twin. Okay, uh, now I'm thinking like a human, then I'm going to go over here and think like God. Uh, I'm not sure how all of that works, but the, the point is this. Um, something happens to our Lord, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, the kenosis, he emptied himself, he's no longer God. No, that's not what it means, not to be made of, uh, 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 of no reputation. Uh, he is not going to be known as who he really is. That doesn't mean he no longer is. Does that make any sense? He's God. He is God. Always will be God. He retains 100% all of his divine deity attributes. But when he says, I'm going to make myself no reputation, he now manifests himself, God in the flesh. But he's not making himself known. He's not revealing himself as all of the glory that is rightfully his. How does he manifest himself? He, he's born in a manger. No glory, no love, no adoration. He grows up as a man. So, so you understand, uh, the, the idea behind uh, not, uh, uh, or, or the idea of making himself of no reputation, he, he didn't empty himself of who he is, but rather he can choose not to exercise who he rightfully is. There's a big difference there, okay? And uh, so with that said, verse 7, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of, of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. First thing that we want to point out is this. What the Lord Jesus Christ does is it, when he dies, he is dying in alignment with and in conjunction with the will of his father. The issue of obedience. The point here is this. The crucifixion is not an event that takes place against the will of Jesus Christ. Okay? The crucifixion is a result of Christ's response in obeying the will of the Father. He was not an unwilling, ignorant participant. And the Father made it very clear. Go to John chapter 10, all right? John chapter 10. Um, there, there are some things that, that we certainly don't want to lose sight of. Uh, John chapter 10. And um, uh, verse 17, John chapter 10, verse 17. There is no law 
against self-sacrificing love, okay? There is no law against self-sacrificing love. And that's what Jesus chooses to do. But notice John chapter 10, verse 17. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life. I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. Remember the sinner in Leviticus, responsible to bring the sacrifice, lay the hands on the head, and then that sinner takes the knife, slits the throat of that innocent animal, and the blood is poured out, and then there's going to be the blood ritual, and that's going to be the prerogative of the priest who has to follow a specific formula, whether it's poured, whether it's sprinkled, whether it's all, well, it doesn't matter. Just think about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, I mean, it, it's as though I'm going, to slash, I'm going to slash my own throat. I'm going to lay it down. I'm the one who's going to end my life, Okay. Uh, I, no, verse 18, no man taketh from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This is it. This commandment have I received of my Father. God the Father is going to honor this, this cataclysmic convulsion that's going to take place between the relationship of Father and Son, and God the Father does it in response to the willingness of his son to do it. Uh, Go to Hebrews chapter 10. The obedience, he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Hebrews chapter 10. And powerful, by the way, Hebrews is going to shed light and and, and amplify and expand expound on on the animal sacrificial system and and you understand what Hebrews is going to do Hebrews is going to say you see all that typology and shadow Jesus is the anti-type all of those types point to the ultimate fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ okay and you remember all all the blood of bulls and goats they can't deal with sins but it's the blood of Jesus Christ once and for all Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. But can you even envision how much animal blood? Who was it? Was it King Solomon who who ordered 100,000 animals to be slaughtered in offering, in a a free will expression of gratitude to the goodness uh, uh, of God? He he ordered 100,000. Imagine being on duty as a priest that day. I mean, there's a lot of animal blood all over the place. What a bloody business. I mean, what a bloody business. Uh, but, but the point is this. None of that blood can deal ultimately with what? Sins. Now, there was national issues and, for, uh, you know, national atonement. Don't, but, but the point is this, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh, this is reference to Christ, into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not but a body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Now, God, de- God demanded it. The idea is pleasure. Uh, the reason is it didn't satisfy God. It was not the ultimate answer, the ultimate solution. So God didn't take pleasure because it didn't solve the problem. It was a temporary fix. It was a band-aid. But that's why it says, that's why in Isaiah chapter 53, when the verse says that God, he was pleased to see the offering up of his soul. The tra- God was pleased to see the travail of his soul. Jesus, I mean, God the Father is not some sadistic monster that takes pleasure. He doesn't get his kicks. He, there's no delight in seeing the soul of his son anguishing in, 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 in agony and travail and in pain. In fact, we're going to see the verses. You understand that there was a covering of, of darkness that, that falls all over the planet. While Jesus is hanging there, 
When Isaiah 53 says he, he had pleasure in the travail of his soul, the pleasure isn't derived in seeing his son writhing in pain. The pleasure is finally the answer, my son. He's going to deal with the, the, this, this problem that plagues humanity. It's called sin. And the only solution is Jesus willingly, deliberately choosing to accomplish the will of his father. But the father did not put a gun in his son's temple and say, son, you're going to do it. You know what the father said? I love you. And here's my commandment. You make the choice. And the son says, dad, I love you. And I, not only do I love you, Father, but I love the very sinners that I'm going to give my life to. What did Paul say? Who loved me and gave himself. Ephesians chapter 5, who loved, he loves the church. And what did he do? He gave himself for it. The work of the Calvary, uh, the work of the cross, you have love and wrath colliding. That, it's, it's a bit of an enigma. I mean, you have ugliness and horror colliding with, with beauty. Love and, and wrath. See, there's something happening between the father and the son. And I always think about Abraham. You stay behind. You just let the father and son deal with all of this for you. Thank you, God. Just thank you. And by the way, who, who would have ever thought of asking the father, hey, why don't you sacrifice your son as my federal rep, as my substitute? Now, nah, we would never have even thought that. But isn't it beautiful? I'm just going to quote it. You stay in Hebrews chapter 10. Isn't it beautiful? What, what the first, the opening verses in the book of Titus, Titus chapter 1, and we read there at verse to in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. Like he had to say that. <laughs> what would possess anyone to think that God is going to lie? That God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Who would have ever thought beyond all that we would ask or think? Uh, going back to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 6, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast no pleasure because it's not the answer. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the book of the volume it is written of me, Wow, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering of burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldst not, neither, here we go again, had pleasure in the, therein, which are offered by the law, then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Now, in the Hebrew context, he taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. So the thrust in Hebrews is, hey, the blood of that lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ is the basis and the foundation for the implementation of the new covenant. What do we know about the shed blood of Jesus Christ? Hey, that's the answer for our sin problem, right? That's the answer to eternal life, okay? So, uh, but the point is, it's, it's the same Jesus. It's the same offering. It's the same Lord and Savior. It's the same Son who is going to experience something in our place that results in a convulsion between the Father and the Son. Go to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5. Hebrews 5, 5. So also Christ, so the context is all about Christ. Verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears. You know, obeying the Father Seeking to do his will. You know, Paul writes there in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, you know, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is a reasonable service. Does that guarantee a life of ease and joy and comfort and peace? And, you know, when Jesus says, I'm going to do your, my, I'm going to do your will, Father, 
along with it, strong crying and tears. To obey the Father is no guarantee your life is going to be a bowl of cherries. <laughs> when you follow the will of our Heavenly Father, there's going to be tears. There's going to be crying, and that's okay. I won't mention any names, but I've shared with you before, a dear sister, suffering physical pain, tremendous physical pain, and she made the comment. She said, sometimes, you know, I just want to bury my head in a pillow and just scream and yell at God. And I said, go ahead. He's a big God. And you know what? It was as though a weight was lifted off her shoulders. You know, it's unbecoming a Christian to cry and to complain and to... No, our Savior cried. He, he shed some tears. I don't want to get onto him. And this is it. That was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. But verse 8, though he were a son, capital S, yet learned he, here we go, obedience by the things which he suffered. Okay. So when Jesus says, I'm going to lay it down, and Father, I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to do your will, it comes with not just a temporal human cause, the shedding of tears and the strong crying. Um, go to Mark chapter 14. This, of course, is, is the, the, the culmination of the willingness of, of the Son and the father says, I- I'm going to go ahead and do it. Not against your will, son. No way. I will not do what I'm going to do on the cross against your own will. But I'll do it in response to your willingness to follow my... God honors those who seek to do his will. Okay? Mark chapter 14 And and, uh, you all know this, verse 36. And he said, Abba, Father. Now, he appeals to his father. And and we'll, I know I'm really babbling here, but again, we we want to take note. There's there's a transaction. There's an exchange that's taking place. Father, son, father, son, father, son. The son says, I'm going to obey you, father. And, and, And now you have the son, Abba, Father. And again, the 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 word or the name Abba is not some infantile gibberish. It has nothing to do with some nonsensical babble, you know, and, and, you know, daddy, daddy. And and I'm not saying it doesn't carry with the idea of daddy. The problem is Jesus is 33 years old. And and listen, uh, as an adult, he, as an adult, says, thou wilt. I don't want a baby. I don't want an infant. Daddy, 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 I'll do whatever you say. When you have an adult who expresses this desire and willingness to be absolutely dependent upon his father, absolute trust in what the father is now going to do on the cross, Jesus is saying, I'm going to give my life, but, but Abba, Father, I'm going to trust you. I, I'm going to depend, I'm going to, I'm going to have faith that you're going to achieve what you're trying to achieve on that cross of Calvary. So the Abba Father, I, I, often people reduce it to a baby like, you know, Daddy. No, he's in command of his faculties. He's in, he's in full, total command of his faculties. It's the cry of a, of a father and a son who are entering into a spiritual project. That's a project. Verse, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will. Mission first, mission first, mission first. But what thou will. Verse 39, and again he went away and spake, uh, and prayed and spake the same words. Three times. Jesus says, I'm not going to be the issue here. The issue is going to be my Heavenly Father. So what is going to happen now between Father and Son? 
he knew no sin, and I'm not going to go to all these verses that clearly demonstrate Jesus had no sin. Okay, we understand that. Water has no dryness, uh, and so it is Jesus. He, he knew no sin, okay? But what he is going to do as our representative, he is going to so completely, so thoroughly, so fully, so intimately going to be identified as the wicked that he is going to experience the death of the wicked. Now he's without sin. But as far as the father is concerned, he sees as the object of the cup of his wrath the righteous indignation of his, of his offended perfection and holiness. He sees in his son the very embodiment, the very personification of wickedness. And, and so as the wicked... Jesus is going to intimately experience the full dimension of death. The death of the wicked. And we know that because the language, go, we're going to go to Psalms chapter 22. Um, what we find beginning in, well, I shouldn't say beginning, but for example, in Psalms chapter 22, we're also going to eventually get over there to Psalms chapter 69. We, we actually see the language of the lost. We find language that is connected to the Lord Jesus Christ as he dies the death of the wicked. The same language that is ascribed to a lost person is ascribed to the Lord Jesus Christ while he's there on the cross of Calvary. And that's critically important. Uh, it's the same language. In fact, you, and we'll, we'll go through this, what Jesus expresses is exactly what a lost person is going to express and does express. Okay? So that tells you when he was made sin, again, there's a transaction taking place that is just so deep. It's just so beyond... Uh, our finite uh, comprehension, but the language is pretty clear. For example, Psalms chapter 22, of course. Psalms chapter 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Um, why have you forsaken me? Go to Deuteronomy chapter Twenty uh, thirty-one, Deuteronomy chapter 31. Now, some would say, well, when Jesus says, why hast thou forsaken me? That what, what Jesus is complaining about is, hey, Dad, why don't you come to my aid? And, you know, that kind of softens it a little bit. That makes it a little more attractive. That, my God, my, why have you forsaken me? Why, why aren't you helping me out? Why don't you come to my aid? Why don't you come and intervene? I don't believe that's what Jesus is crying. He's roaring. It isn't just a matter of his father not willing to come to his aid. But there is an abandonment that is taking place on the cross. Let me say it this way. Well, Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 16. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, <clears throat> Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whether they go to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? My point is this, when God warns, I'll forsake you, Israel, the verse ends, God is not among us. Where is he? It isn't just a matter God is temporarily withholding any type of, uh, of help. It, 
God's not there. Just think about Jesus. By the way, the lake of fire. You know that the lake of fire is every atheist's dream? What does an atheist say? What does an unbeliever say? What does a Christ rejecter say? There is no God. I want you to just think about this for a second. The lake of fire is a realm where God doesn't exist. There is, you talk about the uncreation. Every atheist demands, oh, John Lennon, right? Imagine there is no heaven. You get your wish. Existing for all of eternity where there is no God. I mean, that's horror. That is horror. You want to be your own gods? The only gods in the lake of fire are the lost. God ceases to exist in the lake of fire. How is, how, what is the consequence of God not existing? You talk about horror of horrors. I mean, so when Jesus is on the cross, he, the Father's not there. Jesus is experiencing something that a lost person experiences. God doesn't exist. That's the lake of fire. He doesn't exist. God is gone. And those lost souls are left to wallow for all of eternity in a godless existence. Man, that's horror. Yeah. Let alone the physical torment. But, but that is the ultimate. So what am I getting at? When, when Jesus cries, go to John chapter 8. I, the way I understand, my God, my, you have forsaken me. It isn't just, you won't help me, Dad. You're not there. You're absent. You've abandoned me. The son is abandoned. And by the way, some of us as sons know what it means to be abandoned by the father. Doesn't it pales in comparison, you know. I mean, I had a I didn't have a dad, okay? He he abandoned my you know, he abandoned his whole family, you know. And okay, you know, it's okay. We but but when you have a relationship, for example, John chapter 8, verse 29, and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. Guess what's going to happen on that cross? Son, you're on your own. You're on your own. The experience of the wicked, the death of of the wicked. And what Jesus is going to do, go over to John chapter uh, 10, John chapter 10, verse 30. John chapter 10, verse 30. I and my Father are what? One. You know that Jesus enjoyed this, this personal, prevailing presence of his Father. He's not leaving me alone. Oh, yeah? Guess what's going to happen on that cross? The father forsakes his son, bails, abandons. It's the abandonment of the son. So on and on, go to uh, Galatians chapter uh, thir- uh, 3. Galatians chapter 3. And, and you think, well, why or how? How can, how can the father leave his son alone? Not only the father, by the way, when, when the Lord Jesus in Psalms 22, you understand when he says, my God, my God. You know who he's referring to. The other two persons of the Godhead. The Father and the Son. Jesus is left to himself. How do you explain that? If he's always enjoyed this relation. Loving, adoring, intimacy. With the other two persons of the Godhead. And they're not there anymore. I don't even know how you begin. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Not just for us, but as us. Federal representation, right? For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now, 
we, I, I briefly made mention, go to Deuteronomy chapter 21, what the Apostle Paul here is, is highlighting. What he's highlighting is the object of God's wrath and punishment is likened to what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 25 and uh, in Deuteronomy chapter, I'm sorry, 21, not 25. I'm sorry, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 21, my apologies. It's likened unto Deuteronomy chapter 21. And in the context, there is a rebellious son. Now remember, what's the Lord Jesus Christ going to do? He's going to fully, completely, thoroughly experience our death. He's going to, as a proxy, he's my proxy, he's wickedness. He's made sin, okay? He, he, he's my federal rep. And, 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 and he's hanging there as we read, for example, in Deuteronomy 21, as a rebellious son. Look at verse 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not uh, obey the voice of the father or the voice of the mother, uh, so on and so forth. And then, of course, verse 19, you've got to take this uh, son to the elders. They have to make a judicial determination. And uh, verse 20, and they shall say unto the elders of the city, this, our son is stubborn and rebellious and will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard, and all the men of the city shall stone him with stone stones that he die, so shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God. That's Jesus, according to Paul, Galatians chapter 3. The reason the father forsakes his son, the father, he, he sees the cursedness. He sees the, the, the atrocity, the repulsiveness of, of wickedness and sin. The father abandons the son. The Holy Spirit abandons the son. And Jesus is likened unto that rebellious son. Uh, well, let's go to Psalms chapter 22. Psalms chapter 22. I mean, this is, this is just the beginning of what the Lord Jesus... Isn't it interesting? The first horror that is expressed on the cross of Calvary is dead. Why do you abandon me? Isn't that, isn't that amazing? You know, you would think, well, the, the horror would be the transformation of his soul when, when, when he says, I'm a worm. I mean, go look there, Psalms 22, verse 6, but I am a worm. No, that's not the first statement. The, the, the first thing that cr- the son cries is, you've forsaken me. Can, that, that brought perhaps the deepest hurt in the son. Again, the personal prevailing presence of his dear loving father whom he adored for all of eternity. And for that matter, the father adored his son for all of eternity. And and the greatest horror is for the father to not be there. It's just rather rather stunning, for lack of a better word. Now, verse 2, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. That's the language of a lost person. We, for sake of time, you know, there are passages, Isaiah chapter 59. Uh, there are passages, uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 8. There, there, there are passages where, where, where God, he says, I don't hear the prayers of the wicked. I don't hear their prayers. By the way, when Jesus instructs his little flock and he says, you know, when you guys pray, what does he say to the, you know, the, the so-called Lord's Prayer, which is actually the disciple prayer? Remember what he says to these uh, disciples and by extension the, the little flock? He says, when you pray, how do you start that prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven. And what Jesus is pressing upon the little flock is, listen, you as the little flock, 
you have the privilege of calling the great creator God, Jehovah, our Father. All right? And that's important because according to these passages, God says, I don't listen to the prayers of the wicked. So when Jesus says, again, verse 2, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou what? Here, that's the language of a lost man. That's the language of the wicked. Number one, where are you? You've abandoned me. You've forsaken me. I'm a curse. You're cursing me. Number two, you're not answering me. You're not listening to me. You're not hearing me. That's a lost person. Verse, uh, uh, verse two again. Uh, and in the night season, and I'm not silent. The night season. Now, we do have to stop. There's a third uh, uh, point. The, the issue of the night season, and we're, we're going to stop. I guess we're going to pick it up here, right? What happened for three hours while Jesus is hanging there on the cross? The night season is a representation of the, of the satanic kingdom. It's called the kingdom of darkness. If the, son, if the father abandons his son, you know what the father is doing? He is surrendering his son as the wicked to the rightful political authority of Satan himself. Now, it's bad enough that the father abandons the son. But by doing so, the son is now left to the geopolitical power and authority of Satan himself. We're going to stop. You know, that's the experience of a lost person. Let, let's end on a good note, okay? Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. I do want to continue on with this because, man, what our Savior did. That's, by the way, that's love. You want to know what love is? Love isn't your life being, again, hunky-dory, bowl of cherries, unbroken happiness. Isn't it all puppy tails, balloons, and rainbows? Oh, God loves me so much. That's love. That is love. What, what the proactive steps that our Savior took for us and as us. On a good note, Colossians chapter 1. When you, when you read about this darkness... Uh, darkness in the Bible, critically, critically important to recognize spiritually what's, what's uh, taking place. But look there, Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Giving thanks unto the, guess what? He's our daddy. And, and you know what? He'll never forsake us. He should, shouldn't he? Yeah. You know what? He has, boy, if I could give God, my father, every reason in the book yep. to bail out, I'm the guy that, can give him every reason. And I'm sure he looks at me and he says, man, you're lucky I'm not writing that one down. <laughs> kind of like Sam yesterday. Oh, oh. Anyway, uh, but, but you know what? He's my eternal father. Always will be my eternal father. Thank you because of the eternal son. Giving thanks unto the father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power Unbelievers are under the operational authority and geopolitical power of darkness. You know what Jesus is experiencing for three hours? He's in Satan's realm. He's in Satan's circle of power. Man, again, the Father is gone and the Son is left. All right, we'll stop. We'll pick it up next time. Father, we do thank you for your grace, for your goodness, for your love. And Lord, oh, the depth, the length, the breadth, the height. I mean, just the, the immense magnitude of love. You know, just to have a little taste, a little glimpse of, of what your beloved son did for us. Uh, may it shake us. May it really shake us. May it shake us from complacency. May it shake us from a life of selfishness. May it shake us from, from being consumed by our wants and wishes. But, but may it shake us to the core because we see how worthy, uh, 
how worthy our Savior is because of all that he did there on the altar of Calvary. We just say thank you. And uh, may we just rejoice in your rich, the riches of your grace. And uh, may it truly have uh, an impact in the way we live. And, and we, of course, ask in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.